Now, you, you, you mentioned so many names in that conversation. You mentioned uh, Ricky Harris. Um, yeah. Ricky Harris, a comedian who died uh, about, about two or three years ago. Yeah. Uh, um, I, know, I know he was from Long Beach. In fact, I remember seeing him some of Dre's videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ricky uh, was, you know, he, he, he did a lot of the, uh, uh, I guess, a little interludes on a lot of uh, projects. Uh, you know, he was definitely a hometown hero. hero. And like you know, another one of my kids here. Now I was talking to I was talking to a lady last night who was my cousin, who said her mama was Nate uh, uh, Nate Dog's brother. And I'm like, oh shit, here we go. <laughs> I was, uh, this happened yesterday. This happened yesterday because I have a lot of family in Long Beach. In fact, I'm gonna tell you a true story. In Warren G's album. He talks about hanging out on uh, 18th and Lewis, okay? So one day I was leaving your store, and I'm riding down. I think it might have been, I don't know what street it was. I can't even call it. But it was, I, was, I was over there because I had an auntie that had a cafe on 18th Street, okay? And I used to go to, the, we used to go to this cafe all the time, and I was trying to figure out where it was, but the cafe ain't there no more. Some apartments there. And I looked up. It was a T. In that T was Lewis, okay, 18th and Lewis. When I looked over, there was a spot where my auntie's cafe used to be. There's some apartments now. The wow. cafe was called Callie's Kitchen, okay. And when I talked to Warren G, I saw Warren not long after that. I said, "Hey man, you ever, you ever, uh, when you was, I was talking about regulator, how you was hanging out on 18th and Lewis." You remember a spot named Callie's Kitchen? He said, "Hell yeah, Lonzo! I was raised on her on her, on her hamburgers." Say, man, that's my mama's cousin, my mama's auntie. So I got a lot of folks in Long Beach, man. I got a lot of folks in Long Beach. I've always had love for Long Beach. It's just that I gener it's a generational thing. We kind of got disconnected. So right. yesterday we had a family meeting, and we on Zoom, and what, she's ladies in Long Beach. She says, "Yeah, um, my uh, my mama's." Brother was Nate Dog, and I'm like, oh my God, we might have been, we might have been related, man. Wow, ain't that something? Ain't that crazy? That's that's real crazy and stuff, man. It's just kind of like, uh, also, uh, me and and the Mississippi connection and stuff with a lot of these guys and stuff, man. You know, it's Snoop's family kind of grew up. I would say, I would say he, I lived the same amount of miles south of Jackson as he do, uh, um, I would say, southeast of Jackson. Well, I'm more southeast of Jackson. He's more of a uh, south going in the direction of uh, New Orleans and stuff. But, uh, I mean, it, it's amazing how many people that I'm associated with out here that uh, the roots is uh, in Mississippi. So, definitely. Yeah, Warren, uh, Snoop, and who brought Warren G to your, to your attention, man? Was Warren, who brought Warren G, to, Warren G and Snoop to your attention? Uh, well, you know, what had happened was, like I say, after, uh, you know, we, uh, after the, the focus on radio, after radio was signed to Interscope, uh, my attention was turned to the next hottest, hottest uh, act in the back room, which was 213. And what was so unique about them to me was uh, it was just like this perfect blend of rapping and singing and you know definitely one was the DJ in the crew but uh it was it was it was something that you know you had actually hadn't heard of because it was definitely gangster type music right. but one thing that uh Nate did was uh Nate I was able to take the edge off you know you could you could he could curse in a he could he could sing a hardcore line, and the way he did it, man, it just, you know, it made, you know, it just changed the whole game and stuff. I mean, you know, the average person said, I got holes in different area codes. That would sound kind of messed up, but look at how Nate Dog did it. Right, yeah, right. He, you he know, I have holes out that I thing. an album, man. I got a, um, an album and a bootleg of all Nate Dog songs and hooks. And oh, yeah. That's some, that was some interesting stuff, man. He he had a he had a he had a lane all by himself, doc. All by himself. He he definitely uh, created 
uh, a, a situation for a lot of people to uh, follow. And, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, Q said it best, it ain't a hit if Nate Dogg don't spit and stuff. And uh, trust me, uh, yeah, I had a copy of that uh, CD that was floating around and had uh, all of Nate Dogg features. And man, he did a lot for a lot of uh, guys in the industry. He changed the game. And it's funny, man, there's nobody has come along to uh, fill that void. Yeah, yeah. It's well, nobody has done it better. And stuff. Okay. You, know, you got a few cats out there, but uh, no, nobody uh, have done it like Nate Dog did. It. All right. Now, hey man, you've been in the game for a long time, Doc. What? I know you've seen every evolution of the game. You've been in retail. You, what you've done, is the only thing I haven't done in the record industry. Okay. I've been a songwriter, a publisher. A uh, wholesaler, I had my own distribution company, but I never owned a record store. You have seen all the evolutions of retail and the record industry firsthand, up close and personal. What was the best thing that's happened in the game so far? And then I'm actually what the worst thing was. Oh, okay. Wow. You know, yeah, because, you know, I came into the business in 1972, fresh out of high school. Uh, and uh, I was working for my brother Cleavis then, the founder of VIP, and we was on 108th and uh, Main Street in LA. And, uh, you know, that's where I learned, you know, that's where I, my education in the business began. And, uh, you know, to sit up and watch him operate along with um, two of my other brothers, uh, David and Glenn, uh, who also went on the own VIP record store. Uh, you know, it's just the, uh, all of the stuff that I learned then about the skills and salesmanship and, and, and back then you have to know, uh, who's playing. You have to know the music that's being played on all format of radio. We have to know what was being played on, on, uh, uh, K Day. We have to be, know what's played on, uh, KJLH. So, because a lot of times people would come in and they would never know the name of a song, so they got to hum it, uh, tap on something, or said it was, you know, uh, 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 two men and a lady. And, you know, you have to know all of that stuff. So, I mean, nobody did it better than VIP and being able to know the product, uh, uh, knowing the music that people are looking for. And not only that and stuff, it's that Cletus used to always tell us that if you come, if someone come in the store and buy two records, then you should be able to at least sell them one, because within the two records that they bought, then that's letting you know the style of music that they like. So just reach on the shelf and grab the next one like that. And it, it was, it, man, it used to be a lot of fun, especially back in the day on the first and the fifteenth. You know, they were passing out checks, and man. We would sell people so much music that we would be embarrassed and stuff. We like, you know, I wonder if they pay their rent yet or get groceries. So they buying a lot of music, but music is contagious, man. Some people have to have it, like drugs and stuff. Man. You know, man, I, I, a lot of fun back then. 